Hello, I'm Thomas Hare, Chief Content Officer of the Performance Driven Marketing Institute, a not-for-profit trade association that serves companies in the performance and direct consumer marketing world. And after a brief technical delay, we welcome you to the second event in our winter seminar series created by the PDMI's e-commerce council, retargeting and customer lifetime value. We welcome all of you to today's event, PDMI members and non-members alike. If you're not a PDMI member, but are attending today, we'd love to have you consider joining the association. There's no better way to support the mission of the PDMI than joining and sharing your voice in the direction of the industry. In the handouts tab of your control panel, you'll find our PDMI membership brochure. I urge you to download it, flip through it, and contact any of our team members should you desire more information. One more housekeeping note, the group will be addressing any questions from the audience at the end of today's session, but you don't have to wait to ask them. Utilize the questions tab on your control panel to type and send your question in. We'll be collecting them and we'll try to get to as many as possible in the final moments of the webinar. Today, the e-commerce council welcomes this group of leaders with expertise in building customer lifetime value. How and how quickly can you begin maximizing your newest customer's lifetime value? And how are, they, how are these folks finding ways to effectively retarget new customers and turn them into lifetime brand believers in the competitive landscape? Let's meet the group. We have Don Brown, an, ac an accomplished fitness product entrepreneur. Think about ab roller, ab trainer, and more. And the inventor, the founder of Invent Wow. Chris Foster, Vice President of New Business at Modern Postcard and Chair of the PDMI Brand Response Council. Fern Lee, CEO of Thor Associates, a member of the PDMI E-Commerce Council and Chair of the PDMI Women's Council. Jordan Rolban, founder of Global Performance Commerce and actually co-founder of Global Performance Commerce and our moderator, Greg Silvano, CEO of Biased and the Chair of the PDMI E-Commerce Council. Thank you all for joining us, Greg. Take it away. Thank you, Tom. All right. So direct response is all about results. It's about sales. I bought $1,000 in media and I want to see at least $2,000, $5,000, $10,000 in sales directly attributable to that media spend. Simple. That's been the rule book for, for decades. <clears throat> But those customers have a lifetime value beyond that initial sale, and that is a more sophisticated concept. While it's not exactly new to performance marketing, it is a topic that's becoming more important each and every year. So I'm going to start this with a simple question, and this is open to anybody. Do you find yourself talking more about lifetime value with your clients today uh, or on your own campaigns than you did five years ago, 10 years ago? Do you feel like this is something that's bubbling up and becoming just part of the norm in your conversations? Fire away. Who wants to go? Well, I guess I'll start. 100%. 100%. By far, you know, I calculate everything when it comes to launching a new product to our existing base or even you know just from from the get-go that we calculate you know our return on ad spend based on what we will believe the lifetime value will be of that customer so 100 percent. and that's a, a shift from even five years ago ten years ago i mean you you're ab roller right i mean this yeah. is and back uh, in the day right it was take the ice cream right at the top drive me like crazy back in the day, but. <laughs> but today things have changed right it's much more competitive it's harder than ever to, um, you know, get your ads in front of the right people. So to me, it's so important. You're going to spend a lot of money to get that customer and you're going to have to nurture the heck out of them to keep them. So they keep coming back. Wonderful. So, Thank well, you. I, I totally agree with you, Don, but I think mm -hmm. that if you look back to the days of the Richard Simmons, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we started the supplement business, you know, everything was back end and it was all lifetime value. You know, we did X amount of tapes and we kept, you know, touching and touching and touching right. the consumers. So I don't know if it's so prevalent that it's new. I think it's been in existence for the last 30 years. It's just that the consumer now as media has gone and risen, you know, through the roof, really now looks to touch, you know, every single touch point you can to obviously bring in more revenue. Great. Yeah, Chris, no, I agree with that. Chris, you got anything? Well, I think that from my perspective in direct mail and direct marketing, lifetime value is the first thing we go to. Um, when you, anytime you put postage into the factor of a cost per piece and a cost per acquisition, it's going to be a, a question about whether it's driving a single order or an entire lifetime worth of value for a client. We always go to lifetime value because our job is to get a brand new customer. And then from there, nurturing that customer along. So the first transaction isn't as important as the overall value. So we've been doing that for years. And from a direct response uh, perspective, that's been our go-to metric. Perfect. All right, Jordan, you're up. 
Yeah, I mean, in the digital world, um, you know, where AOV, I think, was once, um, you know, a very important metric that we all looked at, especially in the uh, pre-iOS 14 update days, LTV, for so many different reasons, has become, um, I'd say, critical to the overall success of any type of product or, or, or brand that you're uh, you're working on. So, you know, to agree with everybody, LTV is definitely something that we're all paying very closely attention to across all mediums. So would you agree that it's it's something that is only going to continue, only going to become more important? This isn't a fad. This isn't a phase. This isn't a it's just this is the new way of doing business, that it's really about lifetime value more so than AOV. Yeah, yeah I mean, if that question is for me, I mean, I, I, yeah, sorry. I, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, AOV is still obviously important, right? So we, we, we certainly don't want to forget about AOV, especially from the, from the digital perspective, right? Where we're looking at initial front end metrics just to make sure that we can back out the profitability on a potential campaign. That said, if you're strictly focusing on AOV, there's no way that long term you're going to be successful because this is really just like a short term lever that you have in place to, to make some initial upfront numbers and factors and decisions as opposed to LTV, which obviously is really driving the overall profitability of the campaign itself. Uh, so, yeah. So, Don, you you kind of touched on this um, in your first response, and I think it's something that, that Jordan just elaborated on a little bit. You had mentioned that it's harder to get the sale. The media is more expensive. It's, it just takes more effort. Is that the reason why LTV, lifetime value, is becoming you know more of a focus is because of the, the overall cost of media? Yeah, I would say that more people are paying attention to it. You know, it's been the suggestion of it's been around forever, right? I mean, I remember, God, something I'll never forget from Jay Abraham, you guys probably all know Jay, saying the only way to make money is three ways. Get new customers, get them to spend more, and get them to buy more often, mm -hmm. right? And <laughs> that is lifetime value, right? Because none of the, the second two are not going to happen if um, you, know, you don't take care of that customer. And, and nurture them through the whole process. But yeah, I think to your point, this this harness that we have on um, being able to really target people inexpensively to get that first time customers getting harder and harder. So it's mm -hmm. real important about retargeting and really valuing that customer for future sales. Fern, uh, for you specifically, do you find this is something that you have to explain to new customers, to new clients who are in direct response or are getting in direct response? Are they still thinking I have to sell 10,000 of these things every single day in order to make my money? Or are they coming in a little more sophisticated? I think they're coming in a little more sophisticated. You know, the newbies that come in, you talk to them about, you know, what is the difference between remarketing and retargeting and, and opening the funnel, opening the brand. You know, I don't want to just sell one product. So even if you had nothing within that product line, so you didn't have a supplement, you didn't have more videos, you didn't have absolute products, what else can you sell within that brand? Because once you have brand, you know, touch points, once they have this is, you know, this is it. This is my final. I love this brand. What else is out there? That's what you're looking to, you know, educate the consumer on. So you're bringing up the word brand. And and we talked about this a lot on the, the prep call that we did earlier this week. You know, it used to be I'm selling a meatloaf pan. Here's my meatloaf pan. Buy my meatloaf pan. Here's eight <laughs> weeks to receive your meatloaf pan. Have a nice day. I'm never you're never going to hear from me again. I mean, that's recent history. Um, and what's what I've noticed in the industry is a shift towards here's our meatloaf pan and here's our other pan and here are the lids and here's this and here's some other product and they're all carrying the same brand name and that there is this evolution to these one offs. Now it's a brand. And if it is brand and, and everybody's on their head, it's yeah, that's that's kind of where it's, it's not kind of, but that's certainly where it's headed. And the goal is to flip and sell those brands someday. Right. So build up a brand and sell that brand. So. If you're talking about brand, you you can't do that without the word customer, right? It's that that customer has to appreciate that brand. You have to have a relationship with that brand in order for that brand to even have a chance of succeeding. So I'm going to go to you, Chris. Um, one thing that you had mentioned is even on the, the generational side of things is that there's a difference in today's consumers and that they do want a relationship with a brand, right? Absolutely. Generation Z in particular, and all the research studies have shown this. Look, um, Gen Z and then Gen Alpha, which is coming right behind them, is the savviest customer 
on the planet. They're going to be the largest consumer group by 2025. They're going to be a third of the workforce in three or four years. They they absolutely know what they want in a purchase and in a brand. And what they want is that relationship. They are searching and striving to find brands that not only give them meaning, but create identity. And um, where they're going is, how do I make a choice for the brands that um, not only make my life better, but make me feel better too, right? So there's different, you know, there's a... It's a very different emotion than yell and sell. Oh, absolutely. And look, look, there's, there are functional transformations that happen. There are emotional transformations that happen. And then there are moral transformations that happen anytime we interact with a brand. The strongest brands have this moral transformation that they can provide a customer and the best ads do that. If you can't do that, at least have an emotional connection where your life is better. You are who you are because you buy Kate Spade, right? You are who you are because you have um, a certain mm. coat that you always go to or a certain uh, small brand. There's a wonderful brand called Coco Kind. It's this tiny little beautiful brand. They do organic cosmetics, uh, organic skincare, super uh, affordable and completely natural. And they only use their customers for their ads. Oh, interesting. Right. It's this completely <laughs> authentic engagement. And, they, and, and, it, and like I said, you don't have to be a big brand to be a great brand. And what Gen Z is looking for is how can I connect with you in an emotional way? And that, of course, then ties into the overall concept we talked about with lifetime value, because okay. that's what they want. All right. So actually, the, the concept of customers using your customers as a, as a way to get your message out, we'll get to that in a second, because that's another topic that you brought up. Um, I want to go to Fern and then Don and then back over to, to Jordan in a second. So Fern, when... Lifetime value. If you had asked me five years ago, I would have said that makes sense for supplements. It makes sense for a continuity program. You have a lifetime value. Please, I hope they order for four months before they drop off and then this campaign will work, right? That's the lifetime value. And now with that that shift towards brands, right? So now you can have that meatloaf pan that you do care about the customer, lifetime customer value. But here's the question. What is that content? What's that engagement that I'm doing with somebody who bought a meatloaf pan? Right, I get it with a supplement, uh, but a meatloaf pan. What am I doing to to stay in front of them and build that relationship? So our whole key initiative is, you know, we're building product marketing strategy. That's the key. We have to engage the consumer. We have to have an, an exceptional experience. We have to inform them through research and consumer needs. So, example, Boston Brands, big client, you know, number one, um, you know, Christmas tree prayer. Their money is, is being made, their lifetime value is not by selling a second or third tree. It's by selling ancillary products. It's selling ornaments. It's selling, you know, Thanksgiving. It's selling, you know, fall. It's selling spring florals. <clears throat> it's really, it's, the, it's getting the consumer to lean in because they love their initial purchase so that they want to really, you know, they've been educated. They love the product so much that they want to buy other products. And that's how we keep building on the lifetime value. Is it as much about educating as it is selling? Um, it's big about educating. Educating is a, a, such a key, you know, definitely a, a key pilot for us. It's, you know, it's education, 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 whether it's through, you know, more ads, whether it's through email, whether it's through SMS, whether it's through catalog online and offline, you know, it's all about touching them in different, in different marketing ways. All right. So, Don, along that line, you had a line about Gary V when we talked and it fits in well with that. What, what was that line? Uh, the, one of his books, right? Uh, jab, jab, hook is all about delivering value, value before you sell, right? And mm -hmm. that was his whole, um, you know, his metaphor of, um, of email marketing. So you're going to send that emails, whether it's one a week or two a week, make sure the first few are just value. You're not asking them for anything. You're just giving them lots of value based on their initial purchase. You know, for instance, of your meatloaf pan, you're giving them the most amazing recipes on the planet each week. You got to try this one and that one and that one. Oh, and by the way, you know, you might want to buy this uh, spoon. Fork Here, or here's a recipe whatever. for a cake. We have a cake pan. Exactly. So, so the whole, you know, that whole idea is is, is pretty solid there. But um, what else was going to share with you on that on that point? Um, well, about the education side. You know, real big on that where. You know, you know, going to that, I guess you'll get to that in a little bit on the whole landing page bit and educating people, um, but I'll fill in more on that on the next okay. top. 
Uh, so Jordan, just to, to finish off this topic, you had a you had a um, a line that we had talked about where you have different you know channels for different content. Uh, so you had talked about what you'll do to nurture, what you'll do for a flash sale. You want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So you know the way that we approach it is um, you know when when looking at a customer after we already have them you know pushed through our funnel um, you know and we basically start few different things. Uh, the first thing is based uh, a nurturing program for email. And, um, you know, we've on our side and, and the brands that we represent, we've essentially set up a certain cadence that follows that, um, you know, that customer along and pushes them through the journey within that cadence that we create around them. And that's really all about email, um, about a bit, like from an email perspective and nurturing them. Obviously, we're doing some selling and selling in there as well but it's really about creating and building that strong relationship with our customers. Then when we want to offer them something really quickly, that's where we use SMS, right? And that's really about that flash sale tactic. And it's either giving them a promotion, working with them on some kind of new drop that we're doing for a particular brand or a grouping of products that are going to be launching at a specific time where we can get them to re-opt in and re-engage with us for a sale that may be happening in the very near future. And that's been a, a great tactic that we've been using for the last few years. And it creates, a, I think, a really good balance between building that strong relationship, that strong, credible relationship with your customer, but also being able to sell them things really at any time in which you want to create an interesting sale or a promotion um, you know, around a particular product and or brand. Chris, what's your favorite uh, content to put out there? You, would, uh, well, you talked about founder stories. Yes. Yeah, I think that I, I love founder stories and I love uh, the it goes back to my uh, um, earlier point about authentic engagement. Right. Um, and finding the niche audience that loves your brand and loves your products because they feel an affinity, a connection, a kinship, however you want. And a founder story is part of that content is a wonderful way to connect because usually founders create a product because they're like, man, nothing exists. I'd like to have this. I'll make it. Right. And I'm not alone or the other people really like this product, too. And so I'll go back um, to Sab Sabrina was the is the founder of Coco Kind and and she understood what she wanted for herself and her audience. So she writes about herself. Right. Emails are coming from her. Um, we have another client. Um, they do yoga wear, all organic women's clothing. And I was talking to her about the retargeting card and I said, put your signature on it at the bottom. I said, I created this brand mm -hmm. for smart, aware women just like you, Lori, right? And that's that's part of the creative. And it's it's a terrific, it's a high responsive card because people want to understand and connect with the brand. And the best way to do that is with a founder story about why they created the brand in the first place. Yeah, that's great. So it's funny because mm -hmm. I struggle with this, with bias, right? We have plenty of people we should be sending emails to and nurture and drip campaigns. And at the end of the day, it's it's paralysis in front of a keyboard of what do I write? You know, chat to see it. It's like, you know, I was like, no, 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 I was just no, going to say, like, what can I write today? Well, that's just it. And you don't want to create garbage content, you know, just this, this, just devoid of any usefulness just to get something out there. So it's a, it's a struggle, but Fern, this, it, I'm going to come back to your line of it's about touch points, right? You've got to get out there and have touch points, right? It's it's touching, for lack of a better term, um, multiple, multiple times. And I'm going to use your line while going back to Don and asking a, or, or bringing up his, his experience here. There are multiple ways to reach out and engage with your customers, okay? So it's not just some CRM automated email campaign that gets blasted out with recipes or whatever. Don, you with, and, and I know this because we've worked with you, um, you've had a lot of success in how you leverage your customer list. Do you want to talk through that a little bit and give a, a example of, of what you've done and kind of the different ways you have leveraged your customers? Sure. Well, I can give you two, two basic examples. Like right in the beginning, once we get our first thousand customers on a new launch, we immediately do a survey. And a simple survey with the first open-ended question, you know, what was the number one reason that you purchased this product, right? The answer? Is it, oh, yeah. That first question, they always answer. Because, again, we'll, we'll usually email with some, do us a favor, take five minutes, three minutes to fill this out. And we, we limit the questions to very few. So it's one open-ended, the first one. The next ones are just 
what best describes you so we kind of get a handle on age group demographic right and then we go you know whatever specific about the product if it's flavor if it's colors or something simple and then the last question is we'd love to reach out to you via email phone if this is something you'd be open to put in your information and we get a lot of people that will actually put in their phone number and their email address so we can reach out and dig deep and doing that simple little survey i take that answer to the first question and i create every major headline on all of our landing pages in fact to this day six years later the headline we're still using on one of our core products is that headline that i got from combining 10 different responses that's from great. our customer they told us in their own language what that key headline is so that's one example where you know, getting those people in, getting them happy enough to want to even fill out your survey and do it honestly is so powerful because they are going to write the copy for all your ads. So that's one way I use it. And then second is the use of user generated content, which you see a lot of like a lot of the, the ways I build landing pages down. We have, you know, real videos of people giving their testimonials. So how do we get those every month, every couple months, we just send out a blast to our well nurtured email list. Hey, who wants a $100 Amazon gift card? All we ask is you share a true story about using our product. Show us how you use it. And we give a, we use a link to a tool that makes it very easy for them to shoot a video on their phone. And that what, content is like gold. What's the tool? You can, you can say it. Okay, because it's called boast.io. B-O-A-S-T.io. dot io. Cool. It's a great tool. Very simple. I mean, you know, in the past, we used to go nuts and not get much response because we would ask them go shoot a video have your brand or spouse shoot it then <laughs> upload it here and then email it and the file's too big boast just makes it so easy that's great yeah that's awesome. we, we've gotten hundreds and hundreds of um, great user generated content you know it's raw it's real and it just works so much better than you know professionally produced stuff it's awesome. Now, I'm going to stick with Don for a little bit because I want to finish off some of these, um, uh, how he uses his customer data. So um, you also do something when customers, when they become a customer, you invite them to a Facebook group. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, we've done that. I mean, super big the yeah, last how many few people, times we've done how it. How many people are in it? Uh, we've got just about 80,000 in the wow. group. So what happens is the first email confirmation when they purchase before we even ship the product while you wait for your product join our facebook group learn everything about how it works and what other people are saying so we invite them immediately and it's a private facebook group we, we let people in you know, we have one person that monitors the whole thing they just we let pretty much anyone in unless they're just someone mm -hmm. scamming or doing crazy things but um but overall what happens is they get in there and it further sells them and we've had people who actually get in before they even purchase. Huh. They get into that group and say, wow, this thing is real. All these people can't be lying. And then they come back by and they've told us that. And how, how did you find out about it? Well, I snuck into your Facebook group and I was I couldn't believe what everyone's saying, how it's changed their life. So that's why I and wanted And that cost it. you nothing to do because the yeah. Facebook group is free. It's content coming from other users. Yeah, right? they so, sell everybody within it. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to do anything. And on top of that, back to I'm going to keep repeating Fern's line here. How mm -hmm. many? I mean, think about how many touch points that created on something that you didn't really have to do anything to do it. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's yeah. super powerful. And any new idea or concept, we post it in that group, and we get an initial response. It's just so powerful, you know. Mm -hmm. Thumbs up on this new color, new design. We're thinking about. What do you think of this logo? It's just very powerful because you've got uh, your most rabid customers are in there. <laughs> one, one more question for Don, sorry. Um, you have used that list to launch additional products within the same brand, right? Oh yeah, not just the list of Facebook, you know, customers, but we right. have, or just our email list is hundreds of hundreds of thousands of people. How much of a leg up does that give you when you go to launch a new product? No, it's gold, I mean. I mean, it is in a sense where it's not a true uh, read of what the real market's going to do because you've got these people who already like your brand and they trust you that what you're showing them is going to deliver on the promise. But what it does do is really helps you launch that initial product to go into manufacturing to make the decision. Right, enough people in our group already love it. As long as we continue doing what we're doing and make a good product, then we can sell this to the outside world from a cold lead. You know, so it, it definitely helps you. Decide if you're going to move forward on a new product. You know what it is to me? It's like the old infomercial days. You go out and spend, 
you know, 300, 400,000 to produce a show to run it over the weekend and test it and see if you're going to move forward. Here I can send one email to a mocked up, you know, page that tells enough of the story to see if they're even interested. So mm. a huge, huge difference than it was years ago. That's wonderful. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to ask kind of the same question. We did. It's a, a social media question. This is open to, to Chris, Fern, and Jordan. Um, do your plans normally still include a social media presence when, uh, I mean, you thinking about Facebook, not Facebook ads, Facebook in general for, for brands, or is that passe? No, it's all about community. You know, it's, you want, again, I'm going to keep saying you touch, touch, and touch the consumer. You want to establish a community. How do you do that? Do you do it through Instagram? Do you do it through Pinterest? Do you do it through fa Facebook? So it's not like that you're looking to sell a product. You're looking to enable and educate that consumer so that they open up you know, their funnel and they're like, they have an interest. It's a great experience for them. They get to talk to other people who have purchased the product. If they have a challenge, they can ask questions. So it's, it's, it's a must. Perfect. Anybody else? Nope. Right. Oh. Jordan, you want to take that? I, I mean, I think, um, you know, communities are obviously very powerful. Um, they could also be a gift and a curse, right? So, I mean, depending on the type of product or, or brand that you have, right? You're also getting a lot of real raw feedback from your customers. And, you know, depending on the, on the size of the community, and I've seen this happen with certain products or brands, if they do a launch that's failed, they get a lot, a lot of backlash for that particular launch, um, which also means that, you know, they, they at times have to go back to the drawing board. I've seen this with, uh, you know, a few different beauty brands that have done it at scale that have had over 100,000 uh, users in their communities, and that's across, um, you know, Facebook and uh, and Instagram. Um, and I've also seen it with um, a few different um, supplement and health, uh, like fitness and, and health brands, where they've essentially taken the same approach, doing these launches, um, you know, to the community to get quick feedback, but it also backfires, right? So I think you need to be very careful when really using the community to harness the power of the products or brands that you're focused on. Um, so, you know, that said, communities can be very strong, but it needs a really great balance, um, you know, with the way that you manage things. Do you think it's possible to anticipate that it may backfire based on the company and the brand and the, the product? Or is it wild, wild west? You have no idea. I, you know, for companies that plan it out, um, I think that's where they find a lot of success. But what happens is, look, you could have your first product launch and for whatever reason, you you grab some virality out of that, right? So people just love the product. They're like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest product. This brand is fantastic. And then you move into the second one. And for whatever reason, like you, you can't catch that same kind of lightning in the bottle with this product, right? And so you've now got this community with a lot of users that are very active, but you've failed on the execution of that second product, um, which obviously... Um, you know, create some headaches. So I, I think it's just about executing, thinking very carefully about how you're going to launch it out to the community. Because on one hand, the community is very valuable, but they're also the most, um, you know, critical in terms of how you how you sort of roll things out, right? So for us, one approach that we've that we've used when managing communities is letting the community focus on the products that are already there, right? And they're essentially building that up, so it's all organic. And with new products that we we want to test, we test those to email first. We do surveys on that, and then once we've gotten enough critical feedback, we decide, okay, this is a product that should be added as part of that community to that group of people because we don't want to put a product in front of them and that's going to create dissatisfaction. Do you do the same kind of uh, thought process when, when setting up an email campaign for a new brand? Do you, do you set it up right away or do you test digital and then kind of wait to see if it scales? I mean, for us, we, we, we definitely set up digital first, right? We're a digital, digital first company. Um, we work typically with um, digitally native brands. And so our approach obviously is, is thinking about what the product is going to look like to those first customers that we touch. And we, we test it across a multitude of different platforms, right? So it isn't like, let's just test this strategy on Facebook or Instagram. It's let's open it up to Google, to, to Facebook, to Instagram, to native. And figure out first, um, you know, by casting that like super wide net, who exactly our audience is and, and how that product then speaks to them. Once we start to sell the product and we now have co consumers in the funnel, 
that's really when we start to focus on email and essentially utilizing that email slash SMS strategy that I spoke about a little earlier. But there's really a process there. I don't want to start emailing people, at least for the way that we work, run our business. I don't want to start emailing people right away. Again, if like we're finding some friction on the front end, because then we know we just have a bunch of dissatisfied people on the back end anyway, and we're, we're sort of like wasting our efforts. Right, exactly. Great. Okay. Great. Great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. 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 What we're seeing too, in, especially in the older market, in the insurance world, we're doing totally different kind of remarketing. The old joke is what's old is new again, and Chris will love hearing this. Well, of course, <laughs> So what we're doing with postcards is we're taking a consumer who's come to fill out an application on a digital platform, so with a website, landing page, et cetera, they fall off, we have their IP address, we match it back, and we send it a postcard. What we found, which would be interesting, we thought that they'd all come back in, you know, literally through an 800 number, because that's our whole thing, we want them talking to an agent. Literally 75% of those people in this phenomenally successful campaign came back through and finished the application online. Okay. It's a shocking 55 plus market. It was just blew yeah. us away. Totally. Yet another touch point, right? right. Just a, a whole different way to get out there. Mm-hmm. All right, Chris, that's a natural segue. I don't know. No, Go ahead. It, it, say something. Just say thank you. Yeah. I appreciated that. Um, you know, I think that the, the, the beautiful thing about direct mail right now in this in this space is that it's actually an alternative touch point, right? We get hundreds of emails a day. We get thousands of digital display ads a day, maybe a dozen mail pieces a day, maybe. So the actual competition for attention is so much less in a direct mail environment, right? You're only looking at a handful of ads that you're comparing to. And if it's relevant and it's something that you already express an interest in, it creates what I, I call it a kitchen table moment, right? You have this thing in front of you, it's physical, and you're like, well, I'm not going to act right now. Exactly. <laughs> I literally, it's the only ad that I've <laughs> in the past 30 days was a postcard. It, ex- thank you. That's perfect. Yeah, because it stays, it, it hangs around, right? If you're not going to buy it immediately, it hangs right. around. And so paper, yeah. the, the retargeting ads that I get digitally, you know, come hours after I go to a site. Well, I wasn't ready to buy four hours ago. I'm not ready to buy now two or three days from now I might be, or I might have a chance to talk with my wife about it, right? So that's the one, uh, the what we call the shelf life of, of a postcard and direct mail is that it stays around. And and to Fern's point about the, the data connection, what's happening now in the data world is that we're able to match and link up. And so everyone here has talked about uh, multiple touch points, but the data now is available so you can make those connections. I, we can take an email addresses and convert those into postal addresses. We can take postal addresses and convert those to email addresses to fill out the entire CRM system. And then you can have automated and programmatic touch points that blend email or Facebook post or a direct mail piece. And if they don't buy, you can have a group that you send a quarterly mailing to that group, right? To the people who do respond, you don't mail to them because you maybe use email because it's less expensive. So it really, it allows you the freedom and the flexibility to, to adjust your touch points and to use those channels for their specific job in a way that wasn't possible years ago. Don, you used a service like that for one of your campaigns, right? Yeah, just recently. Yeah. How'd it work out? Um, very good. We, um, I mean, you know, it, it captures email somehow from just site visitors. Yeah. I think similar to what Chris has. And um, then it would automatically retarget them, right? Send them an email out. Then we would get that list. And then, you know, we accumulate thousands of emails from it. And I did target that list. And I was just shocked that we didn't get a lot of unsubscribes. Like, they were a very warm list considering mm-hmm. they never even gave us their email, but somehow the technology was able to capture that email just for them, just because they visited our site. So I, I really, you know, this point, what Chris is saying, I love the idea of the multiple touch points from, you know, they were at the site, all of a sudden they get an email and then they might get a postcard. Um, that's, that's very powerful than the old bulk mail days, you know, when I think about it. I, I want to pivot to CRMs for a second because I think it's important, right? This is a lot of theory and it's a lot of information, not a lot of execution and, and things you can you know, do right now, do right after the, the webinar. So a CRM, Customer Relationship Manager, right? There are many of them out there. You can MailChimp, Constant Contact, Clavio, Drip. I mean, there's, there's hundreds of them. And we can just take a, a quick consensus here. 
is it possible to not use a CRM when marketing in 2023? No. No. <laughs> Impossible. No, and, and, no, and, and I think... Right, yeah, if, I, if you don't want to be in business... Right. <laughs> so like this, are you out of your mind? Right. <laughs> I, 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 three, <laughs> customers, three customers are good. You can use we, email. <laughs> right, so Chris, go ahead. Yeah, no, what I, what I would say is that there's a difference between uh, the um, what I would call an ESP, an email service provider, and a CRM. So what you had mentioned, Clavio, MailChimp, Drip, SendGrid, those are ESPs, email yeah. service providers. You might think of them as CRMs, but they're actually not. They do have sequencing tools available, which is great. But the CRM system is something that allows you to have that contact and move them across funnel. It allows you to set uh, statuses, whether a first-time customer or they repeat customer. It allows you to build recency, frequency, and monetary value RFM models that were big in the cataloging days, right? And so a CRM systems are, email is part of it, and you can connect to the email chimp or your Clavio through your CRM, but the CRM is the place where all that data lives, that you can mine it. As a, as a quick note, there are lots of CRM systems out there. Everyone's familiar with Salesforce, which is, which is great for some brands, and it's just a monster for other brands. Um, all the way down to very simple CRMs like Sugar CRM or one of my favorite Green Rope CRM, uh, which is an all-encompassing CRM. It's a complete CRM system. Uh, so it, it depends on your business and, and your and your team and your staff and your expertise as to what you're comfortable with. And once you pick one, I got to assume you're kind of sticking with it, right? I mean, this is not a you know. Although Don, I think you changed around a little bit, didn't you? Oh, yeah, I've used them. I mean, I've used them all in <laughs> 15 years. I've used a Weber, with your a Weber, Constant Contact, you name it. And uh, we've gone back and forth. I'll tell you, what, we're, in, we're with SendGrid right now, but um, yeah, actually considering going back to Drip, because Chris, you know, Drip does have a lot of the elements that you'd find in a good CRM. Okay. It has complete funnel moving things around. It has a really good system drip. So interesting. interesting. I'm, Thank I'm you. thinking of going back to drip. I left them because you know I thought they they were getting way too expensive, but then we got a whole lot less moving over. This <laughs> what you uh, get. So, <laughs> so yeah. Jordan, I'm gonna I'm gonna come to you on this. So a CRM used correctly, obviously it's more than just your, your website sales or your call center sales, or it's all of your customers are funneling into this CRM. How important is it to manage this data? Do you have to pay attention? I mean, to see, it's still, yeah, I mean, look, these customers, the data that's in your CRM, I mean, this is the, the lifeline of your business, the lifeblood of the business, right? Without being able to manage that properly, you have no insights no actionable insights into what's actually happening with happening with those customers and the approach that you need to take in terms of being able to monetize them the right way. Right. So having a proper process in place to look at and differentiate between the way that the data is actually structured in the CRM is highly critical. And what I mean by that is sort of even breaking the data down. Here's going to be the people that we're utilizing through email and they're part of our nurturing system. Here's what we're utilizing right now for SMS. Here are the customers that right now we've got on hold. And for whatever reason, we're not going to try to get in front of them because maybe there are certain issues that we need to work with them through on the customer ser service side. And we don't want to start sending them what appear to be somewhat sales pitchy emails because then we're going to turn a potential customer that we can save into someone who's immediately going to opt out. And now we lose the value in that. So it needs to be systematically broken out, um, you know, based on however your business is structured. What's the role that decides these things, right? Is this the, the person who's buying Google ads and Facebook ads? I mean, what's the, is this a, a position? Is this a, a, a dedicated job or is this just somebody kind of figuring things out as they go? Um, I mean, I, look, so for us, I mean, we have what we would call like our analytics team and basically our analytics team. So their data and analytics, we actually have a term for it that that is like our internal term. But basically, we call it M&O, which is um, marketing and optimization. But really what those people are doing is they're assessing the way that the front end of each particular product offering is working and then looking at how everything flows through our system on the back end to optimize based on the needs of each particular customer that's coming in. Mm. Yeah. So it is a specific role. It's not an, it's not an easy role to, to hire for, 
I'd say, you know, you're looking for someone that has a, an understanding of, of marketing, but also is highly analytical and can interpret data and, um, and really like mine through all of the data that you have. Uh, Tom, just, you know, I'm going to ask a couple more questions. I know we're hitting quarter of, so um, a couple more that should be wrap up in the next three, five minutes or so. So a couple of simple questions. This is a really easy one and you can all answer it. Back in the day, I remember DRTV uh, marketers would sell their customer list, right? They, uh, we've got emails from all of our orders and we would sell that customer list and, and make money from it. My question to you today in 2023, would you sell your customer list of your customers? Chris, first. Uh, absolutely not. No, I, I call I called the 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 you know your 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 customer file. I call it the golden vault of wonders. It's like you open it up. <laughs> and in, what do you think of it? Right, oh, it's the, <laughs> it is. You look at it, and there's all this treasure, and there's all this stuff. It's like I'm not going to share this. No, I think that um, also too. Given the, and I know we're not going to dive into the to the rabbit hole of data privacy, but mm. there is part of it where uh, mm. data privacy policies now stipulate that you're not going to be sharing, selling third-party data, blah blah blah. And with some of the stuff that we've talked about with capturing website visitors, um, the privacy policy has to be really tight, and it has to make sure that your customers know that you're only using that data for them. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point, Fern. Would you sell your customer list? Never, never. And I am so aligned with Chris. I mean, forget regulatory, that's the most important thing. And But it's also about a trust. It's an alliance with your consumer that becomes your customer. And as we talked about, you want a lifetime value customer. They want to know that, you know, they're loyal, you're loyal back to them. That's the key. Great. Don? Yeah, 100% never sell. <laughs> uh, Jordan, anything to, to add to it? I mean, I, I, you know, I, I have a bit of a different interpretation of that. So we don't necessarily sell our data, but we do a lot of uh, cross promotions and collaborations with other brands. Yeah. Um, so, if, you know, if we have a, a client who has a, you know, a, a brand that's very similar to what we're selling, right, and there's a natural fit, then, um, you know, we'll do some emailing to their lists, vice versa. Um, and this way we create value for our customers beyond whatever products that we're just offering. So we wouldn't sell our lists but we do collaborate on our list. And obviously with that collaboration, there is some type of monetary exchange that's happening there. Yeah, but Jordan, I, th I think that's a brilliant idea, but also I think you're adding more value to your customers. You're showing them like-minded brands that right. they might not be aware of. Mm -hmm. It happens in the that's Kickstarter right. world as well. When we did some Kickstarter launches, there were, there were companies coming to us with huge lookalike audience lists that they want to share new products because that's what these Kickstarter people look for. You know, that that they're just ravenous about. I don't know if you guys know that, but in the Kickstarter world, when you have backers, some of those backers have backed 1,200 products or more on Kickstarter. Like, wow. they're a market in themselves. They just like to buy new things who would <laughs> never even known if they're going to get them. <laughs> wow. It's a huge market. It's pretty I've, got about, I've got about 20 that I invested in over the years, and I think maybe I've gotten like one. <laughs> oh, you're, you're one of them. <laughs> you're one. You're one. Right, so last question. You had a very small scale, but yeah. <laughs> you need a super backer T-shirt. That's what they call you guys, super backers. <laughs> All right, last question, and this is one we didn't rehearse for, so uh, I'll put you on the spot. Any good resources to to learn more about this? Is there ever a book that you've read that that's good? I know Don, you've shared one with me, um, but I'll let you. If you don't think of it, I'll I'll say it. <laughs> yeah, I'll um, try to remember. It. Are there any podcasts? Are there any uh, websites, newsletters, anything? If you're if you care about lifetime value and nurturing your customers and customers, I mean, yeah, just that. I mean, is there anything out there if you want to learn more? Yeah, I, I would go go for it. I mean, I, you know, lots of articles. You constantly, you know, you Google there's five million articles out there on lifetime value, on retargeting, on remarketing, and, and you know, everyone thinks the definition is different between retargeting and remarketing. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a parallel path you want. Go ahead, Chris. Um, I would recommend for a, because they don't have a, a CRM product themselves, and so they're pretty agnostic in terms of surveying the field. Um, it, I'm sure folks are familiar with them. They're called Neil Patel. Um, he's uh, one of the, you know, 
if you if you haven't heard from him, you haven't been Googling about marketing resources. Um, but uh, Neil Patel has a ton of content that's very agnostic, extremely helpful, really focusing on how do you nurture customers in a digital way. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, true. Don, do you remember the book? Not the one I, I recently gave you, but what I will say is one of the, and I recently revisited it, is um, Jeff Walker's product launch formula. That was he it. Really, yeah. Is it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was it. He really digs deep into um, the emotions of people and how to nurture those in yeah. an authentic way, which, you know, he's one of the most, I don't know, you know, real people in my world of marketing where there's nothing gimmicky about that guy. And he's he's done some amazing stuff with a simple little course that he sold for the last 25 years or whatever. Yeah, yeah. and it was a great book. It's called Just Launch, I think, right? That's his book, yeah. But his whole online course and his whole, if you go to his website, you just there's so much free stuff out there on That's um, product launch formula and um, how he does it. He calls it the sideways sales letter. And that's what I really love about it, where, you know, instead of the traditional big, long digital pages that you read forever, ever, ever, ever. He just sends bits of information for free over a course of seven to 10 days. Then you can buy it. You're not even allowed to buy it until you first yep. consume little chunks. But I thought that was really That's great. interesting. And I use it a lot in different ways, but just the concept is-, is It go actually goes to the whole touch thing, right? Now you take this content and break it up over five days and that's five yep. touches. Yeah. Exactly. All right, Jordan, we'll end on you. Any, any suggestions to learn more? Yeah, so, so so there's definitely a book uh, that's an absolute read called Cash Vertising um, by mm -hmm. Eric Whitman. Um, that's a really good one. Um, I like the Russell Brunson suite of books. Um, so mm -hmm. he's the founder of ClickFunnels. Mm -hmm. um, you know, while I don't necessarily use his product. I think he's actually put some really interesting content out there. And then there's a, you know there's a number of, of podcasts that have popped up. Um, you know, that are sort of like in co-collaboration with different digital marketers. Um, and I think each one of them has their own set of insights, depending on what type of products, whether it's physical or digital goods that you're involved in. Um, you know, but someone that I that I do follow quite a bit is um, Alex Ramosi. I you know I think he he had a pretty interesting business um, with Jim Launch, and that got acquired by a private equity firm last year. And now he's doing a lot of different like collaborative podcasts. And you can find that obviously on YouTube. But I'd say for me. As a digital marketer of the last 16 years, cash advertising was probably like probably like one of the best books that I've ever read, and I, I come back to it, um, you know, time and time again just to like you know refresh on certain things. I love the fact that everybody on video right now, you can see that they looked down and wrote down <laughs> cash advertising. I, did I the can't same believe thing. I've never heard of it. Right? I know we do. I'm like <laughs> a junkie <laughs> on that right? new stuff. Like, yeah. Uh, Another right, good one too, Greg, is that 12 months to a million. I thought that was a well-written. I read that as well from you. Great. It's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. That's really good. That's your, your that's right. That's uh, Alex. Is that from you? Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, I think that's who wrote it. Mr. Hare, I think we are back to you, sir. I am here. A wonderful job, guys. You drove some good questions. So hopefully we're, uh, we're ready to answer uh, some of them. Um, I'm going to start with this one, uh, going back to the discussion about founder stories. Uh, do founder stories hold more weight if the founder is a celebrity versus an unknown, regular, everyday person? What if the celebrity is not as relevant as they were at the height of their career? I'm going to jump on. So look, look at Oric, guys. Let's let's use Oric <laughs> as the first example. Chris, I know you were going to say that. I mean, this is a guy who like looks like somebody's uncle from Peoria. Come on. And they tested with him without him. And it just blew up. It's like, you know, it works for me, it'll work for you. You know, that's the standard DRTV infomercial line that we've used for the last 30 years. So, you know, I'm a big believer in celebrity doesn't guarantee sale. Look how long it took Cindy Crawford and Guthy Ranker to build that business. They lost tens of millions of dollars before they built it into a billion dollar company. So, okay. And right. you could argue it took Guthy Ranker size to get that to work as well, right? Mm -hmm. I think one of the more interesting founder stories that are coming out, and I know he is a celebrity, is Ryan Reynolds and his brands. Mm -hmm. um, because he doesn't come at it like a celebrity. He comes at it like he's a person. And and I think, Tom, to the question was, you have to be celebrity. What if you're, quote unquote, over the hill? But that's awesome because those are great stories. In the end of the day, we're all we're not fire hydrants or pickles. We're people. And we all have our own life journey that we've had and to share that life journey with other people it's it's usually the most interesting story you'll hear in a day i just 
Can I add something to that? So I think um, one thing to be, you know, for anybody that's like listening to this or will listen later in the future, I, I'm actually partners on a few brands that, um, you know, that have used founder stories over the years. And um, these are not celebrity founders. And the one thing that I will say is that to get the brand started, the founder story was excellent. As the brand grew, we realized very quickly that we needed to move from a founder story to actually really focusing on the brand and removing the founder because at some point, not every customer was resonating with that story, nor did mm -hmm. they care. That's Interesting. Great. Yeah, that's I, great. Yeah, and also too, Jordan, that's a beautiful um, story about transitions of brands, yeah. because it could go from a founder story to customer story, and then you let the customers own the brand, and they're the ones that take it, which is wonderful for the founder, because he or she can then step back and say, look at the family that we've created. That's almost a, a modern take on uh, crossing the chasm. Right, the founder's mm -hmm. story works for the initial early adopters, but not for the mass market. Right. Yeah. Jack Lang Juicer, perfect example. After Jack left, yeah. now it's Power Juicer. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Got about that. Mm. Yeah. Great Jack. stuff, guys. Um, are there? Uh, this is another question. Um, I think we've touched a little bit on this. Um, are there certain categories that naturally lend themselves to strong lifetime value? Conversely. Any categories uh, that are specifically difficult to drive lifetime value? I'll actually start the answer on that I, because I think I was a victim of this mentality. I always thought it was supplements and continuity and things like that. That's the lifetime value of a customer. And if you're, if the word brand has entered your vocabulary at all what, during you know building your business, then it's now lifetime value of the customer. It's as simple as that. You you can't build the brand selling one-off products to individual customers anymore, right? You have to build that up over time. But I'll mm -hmm. let others expand on that. But I mean, I feel like that's the big thing. It's you, if you're talking about lifetime value, you're taught today, and it's not something that is the traditional lifetime value, like a subscription or continuity, then you're talking about a brand and brands matter today. And you have to be dealing with it. Anyone else? I mean, I, I saw, I, I work with, uh, you know, as, as mentioned, so partner in a couple of different beauty brands. And I'd say from a category perspective, I mean, what I've found in my experience is that, you know, a, a well thought out beauty brand definitely lends itself, um, you know, to a tremendous amount of back end value, not only to your customers, but also, you know, for thinking about these brands as something that we're building up to at some point uh, potentially sell off, um, you know, from a valuation perspective, from what I've also noticed in the market is that private equity definitely places a much higher valuation on a beauty brand, even in a much smaller stage than say like, you know, where my area of expertise has been in small consumer electronics than, than my core business, right? And so we've also looked to pivot into areas where after doing research, we know that private equity or potentially just a bigger company will be, weighing, will be, weighing, will be willing to pay a much higher multiple for the brand that you've built out. So we value it also, you know, based on a lot of like that research around that. And anything with seasonality, right? I mean, you have a summertime mm -hmm. product, get them again next summer, get them again next summer, end of summer sales, stock up. I mean, this, you know, I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, as di digital technology has become more prevalent, how has that flattened previous generational differences and how you can continue to communicate with customers? I don't necessarily know if it's flattened generational differences. I think to to the point earlier that when Greg asked if Facebook was still relevant, I think the question is where are the channels that your audience goes to, okay. right? I mean, there's a there's a big audience that goes to TikTok and Instagram. Older folks like myself might gravitate to Facebook or, or the like, but the I think that there's, I, I would say flattening isn't necessarily the the issue. The issue is where your audience lives, and the channels that they engage with, and that's the chan that's the channel you use to engage those different audiences. And and to Jordan's point, there are so many digital channels that are available. It's a question, and the art and the science is figuring out which channel resonates most authentically with the audience. Right. Well-rounded, right? I mean, it's really about being very well-rounded, right? If you have all of the open channels, you're going to find success 
you know, maybe greater success on Facebook than you would on Google or on TikTok. But on the other hand, from a brand perspective, there's nothing wrong with having your brand being displayed across the channel, right? I mean, that's the reality. And if, you know, we, we, Don mentioned Gary Vee before, and I think one thing that Gary Vee did that I, that was a, a major takeaway for me that I read from him years ago was that when he was making, making content, he was basically making this, you know, like two hours worth of content and then chopping it all up and then distributing that content across each platform in a slightly different way, but where he could use that same content. And we took a lot of that, you know, a lot of those strategies that he talked about. And I found that for all of the products we were selling, it gave, it gave them all a lift because each product was now on every different channel. Um, so I think it's being really like, um, you know, diverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, finding where your customer is. You know, we went from um, have experienced. We really were killing it on Facebook, and Apple came in and did their little privacy deal and crushed it. And then we found, and all of a sudden, we found this huge success in YouTube, which we never had before. And it was just lengthening the amount, the length of the actual ad that we were running and telling a bigger story, and hitting a mass market on YouTube. Believe it or not, we went mass mm -hmm. instead of narrow. And it, it exploded. We rode that for a while. So, so um, yeah, it changes. You know, it's just a matter of figuring out that perfect message that matches that market for that particular you know audience you're going after, and Great. following it because it changes. Facebook is F Facebook is alive again, though, just for everybody to yes, know. I know. <laughs> it seems to have woken back up. <laughs> um. All right. Well, that, that leads to one last question uh, that t touches on Facebook um, and the Facebook groups. Can Facebook groups essentially serve as focus, focus groups? Well, my answer to that would be yes, because I've done it. And um, <laughs> and we, we've gotten some pretty good feedback that has um, rewarded as well. So. So, yes, you know, in small little. In small group. Yeah, it's a small group. You know, we do it in a private group. And it uh, it does give us some valuable information. I agree. It's also good, great for older market advertisers. You know, it's mm -hmm. just one hundred percent. Well, great. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, really appreciate the insight, the wisdom here. Uh, wonderful stuff, and uh, we we appreciate all all of you for taking part today. Um, you know, thank you to the, the the audience, the folks that joined us today, and. Uh, really experiences this event live. It's uh, it's great to see such a nice crowd out there watching. Uh, for those of you who tune in later on YouTube, thank you for doing that as well. Uh, this video will be moving to our YouTube channel likely by sometime tomorrow afternoon. Uh, if you are a PDMI member or would like to get involved in these webinars, you can reach out to me directly to share your interest in e-commerce or any of our other five councils today. Your next opportunity to attend a PDMI event live online is the next edition of Take 20, our bi-monthly 20-minute webinar series created by the PDMI's Brand Response Council and hosted by Chris Foster, who's right up there in this call. Uh, that event is set for Wednesday, March 15th at 2 o'clock Eastern, 11 o'clock Pacific, a preview of this month's PDMI East in-person conference. To register for the webinar, please visit the pdmi.com slash take-20. Speaking of PDMI East, registration remains open. The event's set for March 20th through 22nd at Eden Rock, Miami Beach. Uh, with four networking events and 10 educational sessions highlighting the schedule, you can't miss this spring's uh, performance marketing event. A side note, you can join the e-commerce council as Greg continues today's conversation with a group of brand leaders on Tuesday morning, March 21st at the event. So visit the PDMIE, uh, pdmi.com slash pdmi-east for more information and to register today. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you to all of our panelists. Be well, take care. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all.